Jesus as the captain, you can smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. Smile at the storm. With Jesus as the captain, you can smile at the storm. Oh, hey, good morning. How are you? You're still here. It's good to see you. And you online too. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Whether it's live or a little bit later at a different time, that's all right. We welcome you either way because God's love transcends time and space. I thought I was going to hear, hear a louder amen to that, but I want to ask you a question. Have you ever done the right thing and obeyed God and follow his command and hit the leading in your life. You went where he wanted you to go. You did. You said what he wanted you to say. Only to see everything falling apart afterwards. Everything going wrong afterwards. All kinds of storms flying around you. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I bet you have. So join us, join me and us as a family as we join the disciples in their journey of faith in one of their, hard, their, hardest, their hard, hardest, bear with me, bear with me, I can do this, hardest nights. <laughs> Pray with me. Father, I need help. <laughs> we hide behind you on the cross. May you the ones be the one speaking through the word that's still alive today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Mark chapter 4. Turn with your Bible there. I want you to use your own device or Bible, whatever technology, whether it's paper technology, scroll, or whatever it is, the technology of your choosing. I want you to look at it yourself we are in mark chapter 4 and just for a sake of context in verse 1 as you look for this chapter mark 4 the bible says he began to teach again this is jesus by the sea his teaching by the sea the sea of course is the sea of galilee the Sea of Galilee. And he is there teaching by the sea. Very large crowd gathered to him. And he got into a boat in the sea and sat down. And the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. So this is a teaching day for Jesus by the sea. He is right there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And so that's what he does all day long. He teaches all day long in parables, ministering through the spoken word to the people there. But when the day was done, we are told in verse 35. Now go to verse 35. This is our main text, Mark 4, 35. And it says, On that day, this very same day, he was teaching all day, though, when evening came, he said to them, Who is he? Uh, class, who is he? Jesus. Jesus said to them, to the disciples that had been with him along those boats, they had different uh, kinds of boats, uh, usually like, those are all were fishing boats, not too big, but they were all there, he had been teaching from that boat, he tells them something, he gives them a command, he says what? Let us go over to the other side, to the other side, leaving the crowd, verse 36, or kind of like uh, ushering the crowd back to their places because they, they were trying to go to the other side. Jesus was on a mission that needed to happen on the other side. And so he leaves the crowd. They took him along with them in the boat just as he was, and the other boats were with him. Mike, uh, what other side? I have a little map here. Picture yourself. Some of you will be here next summer. That's a little plug for those of you interested in that uh, traveling next summer to the Holy Land, it's, you might be at the Sea of Land. Let's show that little map that we have, a little satellite picture there. So you can get your bearings there in Jerusalem. You know this area well. The Sea of Galilee, not very big, but on one side are 
the Jewish towns, Capernaum, for example, kind of on the northwest side. And that's where they were. That's what Jesus had been teaching. And now he wanted to go to the other side. Why is that important? Because on the other side, it was called the, the Decapolis, the, the ten cities, the area or the, the, the region where was pagan ruling or, or p most people were not Jewish. There was a different culture, a different race, a different religion. And Jews, just like they were good at avoiding Samaria, they were good at avoiding the other side of the lake. They didn't really want to go there. In fact, they never went there. Samaria was at least in the middle of things. They, they uh, were very good at going around it. But the lake, you had to actually cross the lake to go over the side. They fished on the lake, but they never crossed the others to the other side. Why would you do that? And Jesus gives them a command, and he says, let us go to the other side. So, what we see is that Jesus is telling the disciples what to do. Isn't Jesus giving them a command? Isn't Jesus the one with the idea of crossing to the other side? Wasn't he the one that thought about this mission that he wanted to save someone on the other side? There was a stronghold for Satan on the other side, pagan and demons, thousands literally of them reigning strong in that area the other side so with us is the same thing has Jesus has Jesus given us direction and leader leading and has he told us what to do yes Jesus has told us what to do here's this statement Jesus has told us what to do through the Bible through his testimony through the testimony of Scripture first of all he has given us general general commands you could say the greatest command to love the Lord your God with all your heart is the Shema Shema Israel and they were supposed to repeat it Jesus said this is the greatest command has he not told us to love one another yes he has the other side because sometimes the people we want to love are on the other side of the lake and there's a big space in between that we don't really feel comfortable crossing sometimes the differences between societies or different ways of thinking or even religion means that we don't associate with them but Jesus is on a mission and he has told us to love and not any kind of love but love the way that he loves agape love love by principle even when it hurts even your enemies that's a whole lot of love that I don't have out of my own strength. Do you? Do you find yourself crossing to the other side of the lake that feels you uncomfortable? No. It has to be God's love in you. But he has told us that is the most, if, you, if, we, if I ask you, what has God told you? What, what, what does he want from you? That's the number one thing, according to Jesus, to love God and love each other. Like he loved us. An agape kind of love. Wow the other side of the lake uh, you could you could go to Micah 6 8 for example another another little snapshot of what we are told that we are supposed to remember that verse I don't have it on the screen for you I just I just wanted you to remember that so to 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 do justice and and to love what mercy and to walk Humbly, this is what he has told all of us to do. This is a general command. He expects this kind of fruit from all of us to do justly, to, to live honestly, to, you're doing justly. That, that means you, the choices you make. And how you interact with others? To love mercy. See, do justice is what you can control. Love and mercy is because you don't control everything. You love mercy to others. And then you walk always humbly with your God. These are general commands. He has told us what to do. Jesus is on a mission. And he wants us to come along in the boat to the other side. What, what is the other side for you this morning? What other side is Jesus leading you to that you really didn't do before? For whatever reason, 
He's pushing you because he's on a mission to love people that haven't been loved before. And so he is, these are general commands, but then there's, there's commands, there's things that he tells you personally, that he wants you to do personally. And I don't know what those are. I know what, what, what that is for me personally. In my life, he wanted me to live in the U.S. When I was 15, I moved to the U.S. Not by my, it wasn't my choice. It was my parents' choice. What a blessing as we celebrate. It's interesting because last Sabbath, last weekend, we're celebrating the 4th of July, the independence, the freedom. I'm a citizen of this beautiful country. Amen. Oh, it's like you guys are either sleeping or... My accent is too strong or something. And then today, by the way, is the Independence Day for Argentina. Nueve de Julio. So I could stand here and sing the national anthem. I will spare you. But I will do it at home later now. <laughs> so it's, you know, that's my story. I, it's a multicultural story. I didn't choose it. But that's my journey. That's my lake. My personal. So, see, we have things that God expects of all of us. But there's also things that God expects of you personally. This is your assignment. This is what I want you to work. This is what I want you to say. This is what I want you to do. Let's go to the other side. What is your assignment? What is your personal command or leader? Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe it's talking to someone that you need to talk. Maybe it's saying for asking forgiveness of someone you're uncomfortable. There is another. I don't know what it is, but I can assure you all of us have our seas of Galilees. And I can assure you Jesus is constantly on a mission to take us to the other side. What is your lake? What has God requested of you, what challenge, what shore is he leading you to today? So he told us what to do. We, we can't say that we don't know what he wants us to do. We know what he wants us to do. And if you're, if maybe you, but, but Pastor, like, come on, Leander, like, I don't know what, I know he wants me to love people, but I don't know what he wants me to do for my career. I don't know who he wants me to marry or whatever. Like, I don't know what, I don't know. Those are personal things you and God have to figure out. I cannot tell you. Sometimes we don't hear his voice because we're too busy. Many times when, when and this happens often, I talk to, talk to a lot of young people and, and they want to know what God wants for their life. And I, and I ask them, okay, what are you reading in the Bible on a, on a regular basis? And they say, I don't read the Bible. Okay, let's back up. You want to hear what God wants you to do personally. You have to spend time in communion with Him. That you cannot expect God to, to talk to you the way you want Him to. He's going to talk to you the way He chooses for you. You can't say, no, 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 I don't like that. I don't like Him talking through the Bible. I want Him, I want him to send me a dream. Well, maybe He will send you a dream. He chooses. But I can assure you that you will find direction in the Word. So if you're hearing my voice and you don't know what lake he wants you to cross, it's because you haven't heard his voice yet. Because when you do, he's constantly on a mission to lead you across somewhere to save, to love, to help someone else. So let's go back to our text. Verse 37. There arose a fierce gale of wind, a storm of wind. The Greek says mega storm, a super windy storm, not a little storm. You can, you can think of it as a, like a mini hurricane in the Sea of Galilee. Did these things happen? Yes, they happen often because there's cliffs all around the Sea of Galilee and the, and the winds interact with each other and many times. But the disciples were used to this. This was different. A mega wind, whirlwind. Some translations say whirlwind. It's a storm of wind, and it's a mega storm. Question, question. Didn't the disciples do what Jesus told them to do? Yes. Did they obey Jesus? This one time they obeyed Jesus. None of them denied Jesus. They were doing what Jesus wanted them to do. Crossing the lake. And yet, boom, a storm. Not any storm, a direct attack on their lives. They were going to die that night. 
It was one of the darkest nights the disciples ever spent, especially on that lake. And I assume and I imagine that afterwards, when Jesus had already gone to heaven and, and they, you know, they, they still went back to the lake and they remembered that awful night when they almost died. This was a survival kind of storm and moment for them. And so you can kind of relate to them. If I do what Jesus tells me to do, shouldn't I expect some kind of protection? Why do bad things, why does it seem that the more I follow what Jesus is telling me to do, the more storms, the more mega they become? Mega air, if you want, if I can make a word for you. They become. Why? And we feel a little bit, we wrestle with that because it's like, well, why did Jesus allow this, this storm to happen if they were actually obeying what he was telling them to do? What's going on here? And how is it in your life when you do what God tells you to do and everything seems to be falling apart? Direct attacks on your life, on your reputation, on your family. So, this makes me think of uh, when I was in the Marshall Islands. I didn't sail a lot, but living in the Marshall Islands for three years, you're going to be on a boat no matter if you want to or not. Because 99% of the Republic of the Marshall Islands is ocean water. If you don't believe me, you search it out. And so you're going to get in a boat sooner or later, whether you like it or not. It's a matter of survival. But this time we were sailing and we were sailing the lagoon. We wanted to go out to the Blue Sea. And as soon as we hit that big channel in the Majuro Atoll, the captain of our boat saw in the radar a storm. And he had to make a quick decision. He, he said, I'm not sure whether we should go out because I don't know how big the storm is. And so for about five minutes, he was looking at the radar, looking at the channel, looking at the horizon, and looking. And he finally decided, fortunately for us, that he was going to turn back. We were going to sail back because he felt the storm was too big to go on, on the deep blue. Once you hit the deep blue, the waves become twice as big as in the lagoon. And so we did, but as soon as we, hit, as, we, as soon as we turned back, then the storm overtook us. He said, it's too windy to, to sail, so he brought the sails down, turned on the engine of the boat, of the sailboat. It was a beautiful, like, 40-feet sailboat or whatever. So he, he had his, an engine, he turned it on. Ten minutes after that, the engine broke. <laughs> and so there we were in the middle of a storm with no sail, and no engine, I can assure you, the waves look a lot bigger when you are not moving forward in a storm in the sea. And if, if there are any sailors here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As soon as you stop moving, and as soon as you stop going forward, all of a sudden, it looks like a huge storm. My storm was not that big. Because once we, you know thinking about it, it, was, it wasn't a huge storm. Water was not coming into the boat. But it felt terrible <laughs> because we weren't going anywhere. And so the boat was moving every which way. I was scared. I was scared. The captain tried to fix the engine, couldn't do it. Finally, he did an SOS, called somebody. Half an hour later, a big old speedboat with two huge engines showed up out of the, out of the mistiness of the storm. And boy, was I glad to see that boat. In this case, they're in the middle of the storm and they are not going anywhere. Like you cannot sail when it's that windy like that. You're just at the mercy of the sea. And this ocean was a direct attack on their lives. There's more going on in your storms than you can ever imagine. There are storms of personal problems, personal problems, personal storms, storms where you, you're dealing with something personally you haven't shared with anybody, or maybe you share, but it's your personal storm. Sometimes your own choices bring that storm, but it's a personal storm. There's interpersonal storms where you, uh, you, you are disagreeing with somebody. You're not on the same page. You're not, it's just not working, and, and, and you, you, 
you want it to, but you can't. Interpersonal storms where, where attacks on our, on, our, on our fellowship. There are situational storms, things that you have no control over. Abuse, neglect, all kinds of things, diseases, problems, jobs, lost, whatever it is, situations that you've put in there, but the, the point is the same. You feel like you're in the middle of a boat, in the middle of a storm, you can't do anything about it, you cannot go anywhere, and you don't have any control over it, and it feels like you're sinking. If you read what it says, it says that they, the water was starting to come in, and it was already filling the boat and that's the way it feels maybe someone today in our in our sermon series we've been talking about when things go wrong maybe someone today is feeling maybe you're listening to me and you feel like that and you're saying that's exactly how I feel I feel like I'm sinking in this boat that I'm in and I can't do any I can't seem to do anything about it So the, sec the, the, the second statement that the story teaches us is that when you obey God, there will be storms. And you ask yourself, why? Because the storms are a direct attack on your life. There is thousands of demons on the other side who don't want you to accomplish the mission that Jesus has called you to. Unbeknownst to the disciples, the devil wanted to make a stand on the sea. And he wanted to make sure that they didn't cross to the other side because if they crossed to the other side, he knew he would lose his stronghold. If Jesus steps on that shore, if the disciples see him clearing out demons, thousands of demons with one word, so he made his stand on the sea. The Greek says, so, let, so let's go to the next statement. Let's, let's go to when we obey Jesus, there will be storms. When we obey Jesus, there will be storms. And in fact, the Greek, and some translations have this better than others here in the NASB, they, they portray this. It's not that the, the waves came only once. The waves were continu continually breaking. It was a, an onslaught, a constant Onslaught. You've, gone through, you've gone through something that has put you down and you think you're getting up and boom, there's another punch. And you think you're getting up and boom, there's another, another thing that happens and you're constantly feeling like you cannot get out of this storm. That's what the, what the Bible is portraying. Have you ever been in that situation? Even when you obey Jesus, ah, you say, well, shouldn't we expect some more protection? The boat didn't sink, did it? No. And frankly, there are so many storms that do not happen in your life because Jesus does not even permit them to happen. Because we're in a war, and this war, it's not like life as usual. Do you know what a war does? Do you know what... A Ukrainian family is feeling right now can we not relate oh, and, and yet you take that to the spiritual realm all of us are on survival mode because of the war see we get too comfortable with this planet we get too comfortable with this world and we think that everything is as, as, as it should be you know as usual it's not it there's an emergency in the universe and there's someone trying to kill you period I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I'm telling you what the revelation from the Bible shares. And the beauty is, if you look at your life through the lens of the Bible, it's as relevant as ever before. The great controversy shows why bad things happen to you and me. And at the, at the, the very basic reason why bad things happen is because you and I are in the middle of a war. And the devil and his demons are trying to kill you, distract you, put you down. Especially if you're trying to cross to the other side. Now, if you stay comfortable on the shore, in the shore that, Je the, the, that Jesus is not asking you to go, if you stay comfortable on the, on, the, on, the, on the shore that you are ready, you know, if the disciples had stayed on the other side, if the disciples had said to Jesus, no, 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 you get your own boat. We're not going to the other side. The storm would have never happened. 
It, was, it is because, precisely because, you dare to fight against evil that storms come. Oh, the Bible says that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this power does not come from us, but it comes from God. And it says that we are hard-pressed. Let's put that up. We are hard-pressed on every side, constantly, constantly. Con you are at war, constantly. But Paul says, even though we are hard-pressed on every side, we are not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. He keeps going, for we hold in us constantly the death of Jesus to show also his life in us. Because the battle is not something that we can fight on our own. We must trust the one who's still in our boat. See, the issue is not how big the storm was. The issue was that the disciples did not realize who was still in their boat. Because from the very, very beginning, the controversy is about the person who was in their boat. The whole thing is about him. Let's put out the next one in Ephesians because clearly we don't wrestle, we don't fight. Our enemy is not human, right? Against, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's who's trying to kill you, not your brother and sister. Sometimes we fight and the devil uses differences all he's trying to do is put us in the bottom of the lake because he doesn't want you to cross that lake he doesn't want you to follow the mission and there are, there are so so that's why i said there are so many things happening behind your mega storms that you don't know about so you must trust the one who's in your boat not the one who's attacking. Not worrying about the storm itself, but remembering who's in your boat. So, Jesus is still in your boat. Let's check, check out. You know this story. Verse 38. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion. By the way, if you don't understand this story, if you, can, if you ask yourself, how is it that Jesus could sleep through a storm like that? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I did. And then when I started teaching, I realized how. Because you don't know what tire is until you teach a whole day. You try it. <laughs> so he is worn out, but not only worn out, he is at peace. That's how he could sleep. Otherwise, he couldn't sleep. In fact, this is very important. There are times in the Bible where people sleep, and it symbolizes being at peace with God and what he's allowing and what he's doing and what he's telling you to do on the other side of the lake. Do you remember Azariah and Ananiah and Mishael and Daniel after they found out they were going to die? Do you remember that? They prayed together and then what did they do? They slept. Could you have slept if you knew they were going to kill you the next day? Why did they go to sleep? Shouldn't they have kept praying? But it wasn't an all-night prayer vigil. They prayed, I imagine, several hours, and then they slept. Why? Because they were at peace, and they put it in God's hands. And you can see that in, in the other chapter in Daniel when, when they say to Nebuchadnezzar, look, if, if we are not going to bow down your image. God can save us. Even if he doesn't, this is what we're going to do. We are in his hands so they could sleep. So Jesus sleeping is not just because he was worn out from teaching. It's because he was at peace with his father's plan. But the disciples had forgotten that he was in the boat. 
And so, once they remembered, obviously, you and I would have done the same. They woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Look at the question. Do you not care? Look at all the things that are happening to me. Don't you care about my emotions? And the answer is, of course he does. And yet, when we are in the middle of the storm and we forget he's in our boat, we feel like he is not on our side. We feel like the deist that he maybe forgot about us and he's up there busy doing something. So the question from the disciples is kind of like a little stab at Jesus. Don't you care? We are perishing. We are dying here. We are in this world that there's, there's injustice and there's, there's all kinds of trouble, too many to even think about and too horrible to... to too depressing to think about all the things that people go through in this planet we could say as a humanity we could say don't you care that we are perishing but again if you look at it through the great controversy it helps you to be at peace with the storm that you're living through the problem is when we forget who is in our boat and so what happens is that verse 39 it says that he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became a great, a mega calm, the Greek says. Just like there was a mega storm, now it's a mega calm and it's mega air, the calm, than the storm. But notice, first thing Jesus does is gets up. And I had missed this before in all the, all the times that I had looked at this story. He gets up. And this reminded me of the eschatological significance of Jesus getting up. Is there somebody with me this morning? Or is it just me getting excited up here? When Jesus gets up, something major is about to happen. Oh, Daniel 12 says, Michael, your, prin your prince. Remember that? Gets up. And when he gets up, watch out, demons. It's game over for you. In fact, if you read the story carefully, the demons on the other side ask Jesus, have you come to kill us already? They are afraid for their lives. Oh, the disciples are afraid of their lives. Funny, the disciples are afraid for their lives and the demons are afraid for their lives. Because the demons know better who Jesus is than the disciples. <laughs> In this great controversy, the irony is that even evil testifies to the identity of Jesus Christ. And they tremble. And so when Jesus gets up, this is, this is, this is not a small thing. Jesus gets up. That means the great controversy is finally over. And I don't mean to put too many allegorical interpretation on the story but it just caught me he got up he could have rebuked the wind while he was sitting down hey be quiet he could have done that but he got up in the middle of the storm and then he says be quiet silence the two greek words is silence i want silence to the wind to the noise, the storm that is happening in your life, Jesus rebuked it, silence. And then the second word is like, be muzzled. It's hard to translate, be muzzled up. It's kind of like if you go to somebody and you put a, a muzzle around their, their mouth and they can't speak anymore. So Jesus is like, you know what? I'm going to tie you up. You've done enough. No more. Be muzzled. Now, Look at what Jesus says to the disciples. And he said to them, Why what? A different translations translated differently. Look at your translation. See how they try to convey that message. Why are you afraid? Another word to translate that is coward. Do you still have no faith? Still, why still? Do you still have no faith? I've shown you, you've seen miracles. I taught you, like you've seen me all, in doing all these things. You've seen how I save people. You know that we have a mission on the other side. Why are you so afraid? What I have done for you, has it not been enough? For you to remember that if I'm in your boat, you will be all right. 
That no matter how mega the storm is, this boat is not going down with me in it. Do you still have no faith, Jesus asked. I hung on a cross. I bled and died. I suffered injustice and abuse and torture of the worst kind for you to give you a chance to be in this boat in the first place. Do you still have no faith? What more evidence do you need that I love you? So never mind the storm, sailor. There's someone in your boat who can talk to it. Look at the evidence he has given to you. How he has led you to this point. Has he not provided up to this point in your life? Has he not, has he not given you everything you needed? Even when you thought it was impossible? Or whatever situations you have been through, whatever brokenness you bring into this place, whatever brokenness you carry in your living room, have, has he not given you enough evidence that this boat is not sinking? He will protect you. The devil cannot, cannot do more than what he allows. Even a thousand demons. It's no match for Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is mega air than the mega storm in your life. This is how the Apostle John, and I love this verse, it's so simple. He says, simply, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Period. Yes, we're in a storm. Yes, we're in a war. Yes, we're moving to the other side. Yes, it is uncomfortable. Jesus doesn't, never minimizes your pain. He just maximizes himself in your life. No, we're not trying to say your brokenness is not important. No. You know, sometimes we as humans do that. Sometimes we might say, oh, uh, don't worry, everything will be okay. When a person is suffering, it's hard to say that, you know. Jesus never minimizes your brokenness. He understands your pain more than anyone else, even more than you yourself. No, he doesn't minimize what you're going through. He maximizes himself. And when you focus on him and you see that he is greater than any mega storms you have ever lived through, no matter what you're doing, you're doing, if you're doing God's will, you're going to the other side as long as he's in the boat. It won't go down. Not with Jesus in it. And sometimes, I'm, I don't know what the disciples were thinking, but some of us have the, the temptation to say, maybe it's better if I jump out of the boat. Maybe I can swim on my own. Sounds ridiculous if you're on a, on a boat, on a real boat in a storm. But spiritually, sometimes we fail. You know what? I just bail, bail out. I don't want to go to the other side anymore. Take, take me back home. <laughs> take me back to Capernaum. Capernaum. No. Stay in the boat. Go to the other side. Because there's something there you need to see. God wants to give you a, a glimpse of who he is on the other side that you could not get if you stayed over here. Cross the lake. Jesus will ensure that you cross the lake. But you stay in that boat. Oh, it's okay. You, you, you feel like he doesn't hear you? Tell him. Read the Bible. Continue to commune with him because at the end of the day, and this is what I want you to see. Let's wrap this up. Let's, let's see how the disciples' journey ends in this little story. Verse 41. The disciples became very much afraid. By the way, this is a different word. It was a different kind of afraid. It's kind of like an awe. Well, I would too. <laughs> if somebody was like that on the, in a boat. And all of a sudden, it was calm. I would be in awe and afraid a little bit as well. The difference is, in the storm, they were afraid for their lives. They felt that the storm was trying to kill them. They were right. But the afraid of Jesus is different. Because you realize he's not trying to kill you. He's more powerful than the storm. And he's on your side. Oh, man. Look at this. They became afraid in awe, in reverence. Quiet. You could see like almost nothing. And yet, they started glancing at each other. 
like, what did we just see? And look at their question. Who then is this? Who is this? Who is he that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is why I said the disciples didn't know who he was. The, the, the demons in the story know better who Jesus is than the disciples. They're just getting, a bur barely scratching the surface of who Jesus is. How much greater is he than the stuff that you and I go through in the middle of this war? That's a good question. The Bible reveals that he is the Alpha and Omega. That he is the creator, the one who breathes out stars, the one who paints colors in the sky who makes your heart beat every single day the bible the bible shares that he is not only the fulfillment of prophecy but the author of it the bible says that he is the god who called abraham the burning bush who called moses he is the one who took humanity for me and for you he is he is the one who told you to cross the lake, who promises to sustain you in every situation, the one who provides manna when nothing else is around to teach you that men shall not live by bread alone. He is the one who is alive, the word alive, incarnate. He is greater than the angels, and even Satan accused him, and even Satan wanted to take his place, not understanding the nature of Christ. The whole controversy can be boiled down to this one question, who is he? Oh, and the beauty is that because of the controversy, because of this war, you and I will be able to answer these questions in ways that no one else in the universe will. Oh, I don't know if anybody told you, but, but not only he became a human being forever, this who is he question that we're referring to, he is a human being forever. That ought to make your, your mind just go bananas for a second. But not only that, he is moving. He is moving his throne to your house. And you and I, the Bible portrays the fact that we are going to have such a close communion with Him that not even the angels have known. Oh, I bet Satan doesn't like that. I can see him putting tape in the last boxes. What else is there to do? You know how moving is. What is there to do? Okay, I put a label on that one. I'm being a little facetious. But the Bible does say that he is moving to this earth, preparing a huge city that we could call like a dormitory full of rooms. We know what a dorm is, right? And he says, Where I, want, I, don't want to be, I don't want to live far away from you. I don't want you to live clear across the galaxy on some other place or dimension or whatever. I want to live where you live. I, wanna, I want you to know me so close. Like I know the Father. So for now, we can answer this question by the revelation we have from the Bible. We can answer this question and we can say, Hallelujah, He lives. He is the one who holds the keys. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the one who invites us into salvation. He is. That's what we know. But on, on that day, the Bible says, we will know Him just like we are known. That's a whole lot of knowing. Can you see it? This question, how important it is. So sailor, I have a message for you. Let the storm rage. No, it's not minimizing your pain. No. Let's cry if we need to cry. Let's grieve if we need to grieve. But let's never forget who is in our boat. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the most important thing is not for God to solve our problems. It's not for God to calm our storms. It's for us to know who He is.
He is that good. Every desire you ever had, every dream you ever could muster, He fulfills it all. That's why He's called the, the desire of all the nations. All of humanity dreaming for freedom and peace and wholeness. In Him, it becomes true. He is it. So let's not be like the disciples in our storms that we are still wondering, well, who is this guy? No, we don't need to wonder. We don't see him clearly like we will. I understand that. But we see him clearly enough to know this boat is not going down. Because our biggest problem is not the storm you're facing but the fact that we forget who he is that we don't focus on him that we focus on the problems and the differences and the storms and the distractions and and whatever else is going on and we forget to focus on him the teaching this morning is simple I don't know what your lake is I don't know what your storms are But I can tell you who's in the boat. And he is not going anywhere. He's staying with you to the end, till you cross the lake. And in the end, you will be among the ones who know him better than anyone else in the universe. Hallelujah. Someone today needs to make a decision for Christ. Someone today needs to look at their storms and say, okay, I feel the wind, I feel this pain, and someone today needs to turn and look at who's in the boat. So, whatever decision you make, if you like to share it, let us know what happened in your heart today. How did the Lord talk to you? How did the Spirit move you? I'm done. Like, I don't have anything else to say. Is the Lord working? I don't. But I want to know how the Lord is working in your life. So if you want to share whatever decision you're making, whatever lake you're going to cross, oh, you know what? I am going to do that. I'm going to stay in this ship. I'm going to stay in this boat till we cross the other side. If you like to share, the, you know the drill. For those of you who are new, there's a paper, there's a, there's a text number. That's how we communicate. There's Facebook and all of that stuff. Don't be, don't be shy. Tell us what your storms are and tell us how God has led you through. Because this Savior of yours is not going to leave you stranded in the middle of a storm that you cannot control. This Redeemer of yours is going to hold you fast. It's going to hold you tight. Thank you, Susie. That author of your faith and the one who gives you the will to even do his command will hold you fast. So sing with us as we sing our closing song, our song of appeal. Let the His Spirit do whatever He's going to do in your heart. Stop fighting the storm and start looking at Him.
mighty one and your redeemer bless you and keep you in your storms may the lord make his face to shine upon you and may he give you peace